Good afternoon. Thank you very much. We'd like to begin by acknowledging and giving our respect to the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I'm Susanna Hellman, the National Library of Australia's Rare Books and Music Curator. I'm presenting with my library colleague, Conservator Aurelie Martin. My role is a three-year externally funded position with a remit to research and promote the library's rare books and music collections. I've been working with our conservators over my first year. In a stroke of serendipity, one of our projects was this, studying the library's holdings of books printed by the Birmingham printer, John Baskerville, in the latter half of the 18th century. This is the topic of our paper today. Aurelie has just completed her PhD on Baskerville. It's been a privilege to work with her. First, some background to the library. It's history and rare books collections. The National Library of Australia rests on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra on Ngunnawal and Nambri country. It grew out of the collections of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Library of 1901, first in Melbourne, then in Canberra from 1927, was separated from the Parliamentary Library by an Act of Parliament in 1960, and from August 1968 in its current purpose-built building. The library is the oldest national collecting institution in Australia, a statutory authority and a legal deposit library. As at 2021 to 22, we hold about 10.3 million physical items, taking up 273 shelf kilometers and 2.67 petabytes of digital material. The library's collections include pictures, manuscripts, maps, rare books, ephemera, music, Asian collections, digital, oral history, and folklore. The National Library's rare book collections, and here are just some of them now, um, consist of about 80,000 overseas rare books and about the same or more Australian rare books. We also have rare books in our pictures, manuscripts and maps collections. From the 1960s, for a couple of decades, a concerted effort was made to develop rare books collections worthy of a national library, particularly from overseas. Large, varied collections were acquired and kept together. In addition to those I'm going to talk about today, highlights include the David Nichols Smith Collection of English Literature, the Overton Collection, a collection of penguins, pelicans and puffins, a collection of French Revolution pamphlets, another of French banned books, the Pelly Collection of French Literature and many more. The library also has a representative collection of incunabula. On the Australian side, the collections were built on the collections of Edward Augustus Petherick, London representative of Australian publisher and bookseller, George Robertson, and much later Commonwealth archivist and strengthened through the collections of judge and bibliographer, John Alexander Ferguson and New Zealand born London based art dealer, Rex Nankervell. All of them are particularly strong in rare books, many published overseas. What is very interesting, however, is that none of these three voracious collectors collected Baskervilles. First, a brief background to Baskerville and our holdings of his works. And how did they come to the library? I'll then hand over to Aurelie, who will zoom in further on Baskerville's work. Baskerville is a name we may know best today as a font on our computers. Radical, inventive and determined, Birmingham's John Baskerville, 1706 to 1775, was one of the most acclaimed type founders and printers in British history. Not only did he create a new font that bears his name, but he also first produced, uh, introduced the use of wove paper, the paper we use today, probably working with James Watman the Elder to create it. He was a perfectionist who produced books that looked beautiful and have long been sought after by collectors. The National Library of Australia's collections include 15 Baskervilles, um, 15 of his around 56 titles, and we have three of the books in duplicate. And here are some of them. Though not complete, they give a sense of the scope of his work. 
They span classical, Christian, and early modern English texts. There are one Horace, two Lucretius, one Juvenal, two Catullus, Tibullus, Propertius, one Sallust, two Books of Common Prayer, two folio Bibles, a Greek New Testament, numerous Miltons, and a four volume Addison. Our books also have interesting provenances. I want to speak about the main collectors behind our Baskervilles and highlight some of the book's markings. First to W.J. Cameron. In late 1966, New Zealand-born Professor William J. Cameron, then Professor of English at McMaster University, Ontario, was offered a large collection of 18th century books by a Pennsylvania dealer. After identifying what he wanted for his university library, he wrote to the library's Director General Harold White and facilitated the library's acquisition of a large collection of 18th century books. 1,113 volumes, um, 592 titles. Authors included Goldsmith, Burke, Congreve, Hume, Samuel Richardson. Among them were three Baskervilles. It was all very swift. They were received by mid-1967. They were given the call number RB Cam in honor of Professor Cameron. This copy of Addison's works has a 20th century annotation, quoting the opinion of Thomas Dibden, a good and even a glorious performance, and the opinion of the Strauss and Dent memoir of Baskerville. This book is certainly the most beautiful edition of Addison ever produced. It carries the book plate of Sir James Graham, likely the first baronet and father of the more prominent 19th century British politician of that name. Four Baskerville books were owned by the Clifford family, whose country house library came um, to the library in the 1960s. The Cliffords were an Anglo-Catholic family whose main seat, Ugbrook in Devonshire, is still owned by the family. Their Baskervilles include the New Testament in Greek, the Folio Bible of 1769, Robert Barclay's Defense of the Quakers, and one of Milton's Paradise Lost of 1760. In general, Clifford collection items often have very interesting markings, stamps, book plates, children's doodles, and annotations. I found this copy of Milton's Paradise Lost intriguing. An inscription, which isn't recorded in our catalogue, but will shortly, says that it was the Honourable Reverend Edward Charles Clifford was with him on his decease at his mission of Mahaburg, Mauritius. He was the brother of the then Earl. At least two others in the collection were also with him when he died. As it has a shelf mark, he must have borrowed it from Ugbrook Library and it was returned after he died. Numerous British and Irish newspapers report his death quite perfunctorily with little detail aside from the fact that Lord Clifford had received the melancholy information of the death and that he expired on the 22nd of October, aged 40. On the front end paper is a bookseller's label for Williams Library in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. The library was adjacent to the assembly rooms and can be seen in a trade card at the British Museum and a lithograph from 1821. A catalogue for, for 1818 for this library lists Milton's Paradise Lost was in their stock, but without any detail on the edition. The Devesi collection, or Devesi collection, um, was acquired by the library in 1967 from John Vesey, sixth Viscount Devesi. The Devesies were an, an Anglo-Irish family of Norman descent who rose to prominence in the 17th century with a number of Church of Ireland appointments, then a baronetcy, then a peerage. Their primary seat was Abbey Licks, the original building formerly a Cistercian monastery. The Devesi collection consists of 1,648 books in 2,900 volumes. It's really quite large, including six incunabula and numerous journals. The collection it really isn't well known. It was not publicized when it was first acquired. The then Lord Vesey was married to the sister of Anthony Armstrong Drones, husband of Princess Margaret. The collection includes four basketballs, Milton's Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, a book of common prayer and a folio Bible. The Bible bears that typically confident inscription, De Vesey. We do have a brief manuscript catalogue um, to the collection dating to 1799 with binding lists from the 1820s, but these do not appear, at least as I can see so far. 
Now to Fitzharding. Three Baskervilles are among the Fitzharding collection, a book of common prayer, a Lucretius and a juvenile. The collection's Baskerville holdings were identified as a strength from the earliest discussions with L.F. Laurie Fitzharding, himself a former National Library staff member from 1934 to 44, among other things. His collections were begun by his father, Eric, a solicitor. The collection consists of around 300 volumes of early and fine printing, and the transfer was finalised in the 1990s. Highlights include an incunabula Coburga Bible, a, a Venetian 1483 Ovid Metamorphoses, and Kelmscott and Golden Cockerel vi um, volumes. This Book of Common Prayer, one of the earliest owners, could be W. Harding, a British painter, draftsman, active, 1787 to 92. A later identifiable owner is C. Chenevik's Trent Trench with a typescript ownership label in the front end paper. Trench was a 20th century British historian who wrote on topics as diverse as horsemanship, angling, Irish Catholic landlords and the rebellion of Charles II's son, the Duke of Monmouth in the 17th century. There are three Baskervilles in um, from Sir Brian Hone. Hone was a South Australian born Rhodes Scholar, headmaster of Cranbrook School in Sydney from 1940 to 50 and Melbourne Grammar School 1950 to 70. Hone was particularly interested in printing history, particularly fine printing. His collection includes about 148 rare books. He set up the Marlborough College Press. We have his Baskerville, Horace, Sallust and Catullus. One of the previous owners of Catullus was John Welchman Waitley, a prominent figure in Birmingham in the early 19th century. Thank you. Over to Aurelie. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Good afternoon. Um, now I will explore uh, the sort of the material aspect of these books. And um, Wrong button, sorry. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, the conference topics about exploring the concept of embellishment in all its form. And after hearing this morning how Peter Lysiotis um, so brilliantly described it and sort of deconstructed the book um, to show. <laughs> um, to show how each part of the book can be embellished. Uh, it seems to me that Baskerville sort of perfectly embodies this concept as he spent most of his life trying to embellish the book in many ways. Um, regarded by historians and some of his contemporaries as a mechanical genius, Baskerville was a successful businessman manufacturing paper. And he endeavored to master and improve bookmaking as a whole. His experiments and innovations concerned several aspects. He's known, of course, uh, for designing a new typeface bearing his name, and you can see here on the screen the original punches uh, that are now uh, in Cambridge University Library. And it shows the beauty of Baskerville's letters, but also our primary evidence of the 18th century craftsmanship and the punch, punch cutter skills that were required. Uh, Baskerville's innovative, innovative mind worked towards improving the printing press itself. He manufactured a darker ink, uh, hot pressed his printed sheets, all that to improve the contracts of the Finnish um, paper. And as Susanna mentioned, he first introduced the use of wolf paper in printing. Now, I'm just going to say a few words on that. Uh, Philip Caspico, uh, Baskerville's bibliographer, mentioned that um, he used wolf paper only in a few sections of his first edition, the quarto, Virgil printed in 1757, which is regarded as his masterpiece. And um, so you can see here in transmitted light that the title page is sort of uh, showing the chain and laid marks, clearly visible here. But then when you go further into the book, you, you can see the pattern of the cloth covered laid mold used to produce the smoother finish characteristic of wolf paper. So yeah, and you see here, uh, an enlargement. For Baskerville, this was again a means to embellish his printed work by providing a smoother surface to set off his new type and not use the bumpy laid, as uh, Peter puts it this morning. This is all known in the literature, but I started while looking at all these copies that um, actually in the Milton's poetical work, uh, printed only a year later, the paper also had a very smooth surface. Now, he printed a first edition, an October one, on laid paper, 
But then on this quarter one, um, this sort of, uh, it's a bit, the paper is much smoother here. Of course, Gaskell's eyes, expert eyes have not missed this detail. And he writes, quote, it might be mistaken for a wolf paper as the chain and wire marks are almost obliterated. However, looking at several pages in different copies, it seems hard to believe that the paper uses is not wolf, or at least maybe, um, maybe another trial at a smoother paper. So if the invention of wolf paper is generally attributed to James Watman, some like to think that Baskerville may have played a role and the paper used in the Milton Quarter could be uh, a way to shed new light on this potential collaboration. Something maybe for another PhD. <laughs> um, now, the last phase of bookmaking, uh, some may consider is binding, whereby a collector or customer can choose to embellish uh, printed sheets following a personal taste or adopting the fashion of the time. Uh, from surveying about 2,700 copies, I found that the Baskerville editions can be found in many different types of binding, but the vast majority have been bound in boards, as you can see uh, here, and most are covered in tan skin, more rarely in parchment, and more, uh, most are in fine bindings with simple to elaborate tool decoration. Some rare examples have survived in more modest paper cover, but most have been elegantly de decorated um, to satisfy the taste of bibliophiles who recognize Baskerville's edition since the very beginning as beautiful object to acquire. And evidence of which comes from some of the most renowned binder contemporary to Baskerville who were employed to bind these editions such as Ed Moore of Cambridge, Richard Montagu, Richard Dimmitt, or here, as you can see on the screen, this Roger, bind, Roger Payne binding um, on the Virgil that he made in Eton in 1764. They were also, of course, cheaper binding, but they're usually found on more popular works, such as this copy of um, a pocket dictionary, which is bound in brown sheepskin, uh, which is probably the cheapest leather uh, available at the time in England. This copy, uh, the copy from the National Library, uh, seems to follow the same pattern. Most are bound in contemporary 18th century binding, really typical of what constituted uh, a gentleman's or country house library at the period, this period in the British Isles, such as the Cliffords. Um, the decoration vary from simple gold to rolls or frames to more complex central ornaments with brown calf skins, red, uh, dark green hair sheep skin covers. Late bindings can also be found dating from the first quarter of the 19th century, and that corresponds to a period where Baskerville regained in popularity, um, partially thanks to uh, Thomas Dibdin, who praised and described nearly all of Baskerville's work and contributed to uh, making his books objects sought after by bibliophiles. However, none of the NLA copies seem to have the characteristic of the so-called Baskerville binding. Now, Baskerville pushed his vision of bookmaking to the last phase, the binding, as he employed um, a workshop in, in Birmingham to bind his editions and seemingly offered the service to a specific customer, that of a book already bound in a specific style with a range of tools, example of which you can see on the screen here on a book of common prayer, the little Horace, um, Congress work, and then his master, one of his masterpieces, uh, the Folio Bible, printed in 1763. Now, the Basque bindings can be identified by um, a set of specific features, such as a striking uh, and uh, marble paper that Baskerville also had designed, uh, the use of his own type to title spine label. So as Rauschenberg we learned this morning, uh, title was also the last brush of color, apparently. Uh, Baskerville was also, uh, also into this um, characteristic. And the last one is a specific, the use of a specific uh, role down there. It's a floral role. Um, during his printing venture, Baskerville employed several binders in Birmingham. And this certainly started very early uh, with the Virgil, but the bulk of the Baskerville bindings were produced between 1758 and 66, uh, with this more definite style here in the middle. And so the characteristic feature are the decorated paper and the floral roll. So I was therefore quite surprised uh, while surveying the rare book collection for a conservation project when I picked up that folio Bible. It immediately struck me as a typical Baskerville binding with a floral roll, but why did I miss it before? I then realized that this Bible had not in fact been printed by Baskerville, but instead by his most virulent opponent, uh, Nicholas Bowden. Now this family Bible is at the very heart of a known controversy that blew up between Baskerville and Bowden in 68. At the time, Baskerville had stopped printing and left his former Robert Martin in charge of his presses. 
Martin had continued printing in his own name and he joined two local Birmingham printers, uh, Adams and Borden, to print a Bible. Now, the problem is that when they did that, that he, they put an, advertise, an advertisement um, in the Harris Gazette in Birmingham saying, quote, much more beautifully and methodic, methodically displayed than in Mr. Baskerville's. Direct attack, of course, on Baskerville. I don't know if it was unsolicited, um, but Baskerville was so furious that the two exchanged open uh, attacks, vindication for more than a year by means of open letters published in the Gazette. And um, Baskerville was in fact so displeased by this Bible that it made him come back to printing in 69 to print another better version of this Bible. Um, so the, the NLA copy, um, is it really um, a Baskerville? I had to identify a bit more closely, of course. And so you can see here that it's the exact same role that has been used. And um, here, uh, this tool here was also found on this folio Bible uh, in a Baskerville binding. And the letter used to title the spine are not Baskerville's type, but they were also used on another 63 folio Bible uh, from Momsel Library, which has also the same uh, little corner piece here. So up to that point, this style of binding, uh, this floral in particular, had only been observed on Baskerville imprints. And this Bible therefore raised interesting question on how this Birmingham workshop was working. It seems to suggest that the workshop potentially continued working without Baskerville when he stopped printing, providing services to local customers and printers indiscriminately, using some of the tools they already had at hand. The exact role of Robert Martin is also interesting to investigate since he was involved in printing uh, the last part of this Bible. And one can wonder if in fact the NLA copy was not uh, Robert Martin's personal copy that he just asked um, the Birmingham workshop to bind. And it's not impossible because um, Martin may have been involved in the everyday dealings of Baskerville business with the bindery. And Martin was in fact listed as a book binder amongst other things in the Birmingham directory. This is a very appealing theory, of course, um, but it cannot be proven at this point as the provenance of the Bible could not be traced back to Baskerville, to Martin, sorry, or any other archive I looked at. Um, one way forward would be to look at the bindings found on the remaining copies of the Bowdoin Bibles. And I had only found two so far because I wasn't looking for them. And one never takes enough pictures in field work. Um, and they are bound in a brown reverse skin, so presumably a cheaper material than its red goatskin counterpart, such as this one as well, and which sort of make the red one goatskin more unique. Um, to finish, I will simply go back to Michelle's brown in introduction yesterday when she talked about treasure bindings and she asked what role decoration plays in the intention and the reception of the book. Baskerville said certainly intended to embellish his book to provide beautiful objects to admire and acquire like the copies held by the NLA all the way to the binding. But the Bowdoin Bible um, maybe tells a different story, that of Birmingham, Birmingham workshop and the reality of how it worked at the time, a very precious information on a trade that left very little written evidence on the way it worked. Thank you.